Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kate from the Functional Medicine Center. And this is part two in our three or four part series on gut healing. We bring these classes to you free of charge for all of our members. And if you're not a member of the clinic, but you'd like to be, let us know. Um, we, Kelly and I talk a lot about gut healing in individual, sorry, let me resume my screen share. There we go. In our individual sessions with patients. Um, but we also wanted to lay the groundwork. We've done this gut healing talk like five different times, all different ways. This time we broke it up into smaller sections so that it wasn't too much all at once. Last time, if you didn't hear part one, go back and listen later, but we talked a little bit more about the testing. I know a few of you were there. Um, and we talked about food sensitivity testing or food allergy testing. We talked about stool testing, which gives us a sense of what is going on in your microbiome. Do you have enough beneficial bacteria or good bacteria? Um, commensal bacteria is another word for that. Do you have too much of the harmful bacteria? So the thing I want to start with is all of this learning about the microbiome is still in its infancy. We certainly know more now than we did 10 years ago. We know more now than we did 20 years ago. Um, but there's a lot of debate going on does it matter if we get a harmful virus like COVID or the flu, something that we know to be bad or hard for our immune system to fight? Does it matter if we have a healthy immune system and a healthy gut? Is it really more about the terrain it's called of the host and how healthy your gut is? Or is it about what you're being exposed to? Or is it a little bit of both? And I tend to believe it's a little bit of both. It's a combination of what we call germ theory, which is like the viruses or the bacteria are bad and host theory, which is like the host needs to be very robust. We want your immune system to work the way it's supposed to work. We want you to mount a response to a pathogen as quickly as possible. And then we want the inflammation to come down as quickly as possible. So I'm bringing that up because I just went to a COVID conference a couple of weeks ago with the FLCCC and some of the providers that are coming from conventional medicine into functional or integrative medicine, they still are a little bit stuck in the old way of looking at the body, which is everything is sterile and the virus is bad, COVID is bad. And it's not that simple, right? Because the body's not sterile. There's healthy, helpful viruses, bacteria, and fungi. And we're going to talk about all of that today. Um, I also wanted to say pretty much all Western chronic diseases are associated with an unhealthy gut. The good news is that we can actually heal our gut. Um, and we're gonna talk about that today. In the chat, I also, just a side note, I posted a link because I was a lactation consultant um, when, let's see, from, from 2000, I have to do the math, 2014 to 2020. And as a lactation consultant, the number one thing is if we start out life with a healthy gut because we're breastfed, then we're much less likely to have chronic illness. Um, the longer the duration of breastfeeding is directly associated with health. So the longer you're breastfed, the healthier you are, the less autoimmune conditions you get. Having said that, I have two children that nursed till um, age four and age five, and both of them had autoimmune disease. And so I was really interested in how do I heal my kids? And then that, of course, morphed into how do I help my patients, right? So that's how I got here. But I posted a link in the chat for a silent auction that's happening today for an organization that's awesome called Breastfeed Durham. They specifically help women of color learn how to breastfeed because it's not always easy to know what to do. It's a dance. And they're doing a silent auction because they're having a, a gala this week. And it looks pretty great. So if you have time, check it out because there's even like $5 items you can bid on. So if you have any inclination to help out, that's a great organization that takes the, their administrative people take zero. Everybody's a volunteer and it's a great organization. Um, there's our website. There's our number if you need to call us. And let's jump right in. So we know that the skin is the window to the gut. 
And by this, I mean, when I'm examining the patient, I can tell what's going on in the gut depending on what the skin looks like. So psoriasis is a direct autoimmune condition where the T cells or the immune system in the skin are directly attacking the skin. You don't want that, right? You don't want your own body to attack your skin. Atopic dermatitis is another word for eczema. This is also considered autoimmune where the body is attacking the skin. Acne vulgaris is, as you guys know, just acne. Um, we used to think there was just one bacteria causing acne, but it turns out there's all different, a large range of imbalances depending on the patient. Um, your hormones come into play, which we'll talk about in the end. Everything's connected, right? So DHEA, which is one of your adrenal hormones, is really important when it comes to if you're having acne. Progesterone is really important. So patients that have too high DHEA, too low progesterone are prone to get acne. Um, rosacea is... I was, I, I dated myself yesterday because in the office I was mentioning Bill Clinton and then I realized the person I was talking to was too young probably. <laughs> but do you guys remember, you know, Bill Clinton always had the rhinophyma, the, the um, red nose. And then sometimes you would actually see the redness under his, on his cheeks when he was giving speeches and they couldn't even really cover it that well with makeup. And that was um, a sign of rosacea. And oftentimes rosacea directly tells you if you have leaky gut. And rosacea is interesting because it's this rash right here. I actually have it too. And I can tell, and most patients can tell, when you wake up in the morning, what's going on with your gut just by looking at your face. Um, when patients have lupus, they the rosacea gets severe. We call that the butterfly rash, but it's all along the same spectrum. It doesn't really matter what we call it. You can see the skin's inflamed because it's red. Um, and that's how you know how the gut is doing, because we can't actually look right from the outside at your intestine, but we can certainly see how your skin looks. Alopecia areata is the medical term for autoimmune hair loss. When people are losing hair and they have, you know, you'll see women especially have bald spots, um, usually on the top. Hydradenitis superativa is a skin condition where people get chronic it looks like infections in their groin and their armpits, sometimes under their breasts, um, more common in women, more common in women of color. Hydradenitis superativa is very painful. And the interesting thing about it is we used to think it was caused by a bad bacteria, but then we learned that when we cultured it, not, there, was, there was a lot of pus, a lot of yellow pus, but no bacteria was present. So it's not an infection, even though it kind of looks like it, it looks almost like boils. Um, it's actually just autoimmune. And that's something that um, one of my sisters was diagnosed with years ago. And I started to learn then how the microbiome, healing the microbiome will heal the skin. So our goal, if you don't have any of these conditions, our goal is to prevent those. But if you already have these conditions, I am gonna talk a little bit to um, what you can do to heal, but most of my talk is how to prevent. Oops, sorry. Okay, so we know that the skin and the gut are active, complex, immunological, and neuroendocrine organ organs. What does that mean? Well, they're complicated. There's a bunch of different body sy systems all present in the skin and present in the gut. So obviously when you touch your skin, you can feel because there's nerve endings there, right? You know your skin is well perfused, meaning you're getting blood flow because it's not very pale. Um, or pasty. You can even tell how hydrated someone is if you squeeze their skin and the skin gets stuck. I know there's a nurse on the call, right? So you can, that's called turgor. So there's all different things we can learn from looking at the skin and it's complex. And the gut is also complex because the gut is where most of our immune system lives. But we also know that our nervous system and our, our endocrine system greatly affect our gut. If you've ever gotten nervous before taking an exam, that's your nervous system and your endocrine system working together to give you a stomach ache, right? Um, we know that the skin is exposed to the outside environment, but so is the gut on a frequent basis. And the skin and the gut both are home to a lot of different micro microbiomes or a lot of different microbes. Microbes just means bacteria, viruses, and fungi. The skin and the gut must operate 
properly or appropriately in order to enable the organisms to maintain homeostasis and survive. So what is homeostasis? So homeostasis is like the way the body should be. And it is always what we are aiming for in this clinic, because we are trying to prop you back up using herbs and using nutraceuticals or supplements so that your body will do what it knows to do. Your body always wants to come back to homeostasis and, um, yeah, that's it. Notably, the skin is the body's largest organ. I don't know if you guys knew that, but it's the largest organ and it serves as a defensive obstruction against injuries. I think we all know that, right? But the skin is really important because there's eight layers of protection from, you know, anything that's coming in, whether it be toxins, microbes, um, you know, physical injury, right? So the skin's a really important organ. The gut contains trillions, not billions. We used to think billions, but we now know trillions of microbial communities. So you have more bacteria in your gut than you do cells in your body. It's recognized as a virtual organ. So we call it an organ, even though we're talking about mouth all the way down esophagus, through the stomach, through the small, through the large intestine to the anus. We're talking about the entire thing. We consider that an organ associated with health and longevity. Um, when they do research on seniors, people, octogenarians, people in their eighties that are healthy, guess what? They have the most diverse beneficial bacteria in their gut. That is the secret to longevity. Um, the gut microbiome has both beneficial and adverse impacts on the normal physiology. So it also has good and bad impacts on the skin and the homeostasis of both the gut. Okay. We're not going to, that was a lot of words. I'm not going to use that many words again. So this is important because there's a feedback mechanism here. So I'm going to talk about a couple of things that people tend to do that maybe are not the best. Number one is triple antibiotic or neosporin ointment is over the counter. I see people using neosporin when they don't need it, right? I see people, it's an antibiotic. It's three different antibiotics all in a, an ointment or a cream. You can get it either way. Um, and you are killing the good bacteria with the antibiotic. Now there's times when it's appropriate, especially if we know there's strep or staph living on the skin, but it's not something we should be using unless we know that there is a, a, an overgrowth of harmful bacteria. So that's one thing I wanted to talk about when, when we treat the gut and the skin, like an organic garden, where we're trying to really feed and have thrive the good bacteria, um, and the beneficial viruses and beneficial yeast, we have a much healthier environment. There's a bunch of different ways that we can get rid of pathogens or bad bacteria. One of them is crowding them out. So you just have so much good healthy flora, it is another word for it. You just have so much good stuff on your skin. There's no possible way there's enough room for the bad, right? So that's one way. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out here is that there's a lot of interaction going on and over here on the right where it says external elements, UVB, the skin is exposed to sunlight or to broad spectrum light, and it filters out the wavelengths of light. The skin is so smart. It filters out the wavelengths of light that it needs in order to make vitamin D, right? So you can take pills of vitamin D all day, which is great if your vitamin D is low to get it up, but you also need white light or broad spectrum light in order to increase your vitamin D. What happens is the signal goes from the skin to the gut and the vitamin D increases what's called T regulatory cells in the immune system. So the vitamin D says, come on guys, we're gonna go calm everything down. We're gonna make everything back to homeostasis. We're gonna heal. T regulatory cells are awesome. If we all had uh, an immune system that was dominated by T regulatory cells, there would be no cancer and there would be no autoimmune disease. It comes down to getting sunlight on the skin. Now, the other side of that conversation is you don't want to get sunburn, but when you get your vitamin D up, you're actually much less likely to get sunburn. Um, and you can get, you know, 10 to 15 minutes and then cover up with, uh, you know, clothing or sunscreen. 
The other thing I wanted to say is that short chain fatty acids, which I think there's more coming soon, but short chain fatty acids are made in the gut and they are sent to the skin. Short chain fatty acids are breakdowns of our foods. And the, the only way we create short chain fatty acids is, is if we have enough of the beneficial or the good bacteria in the gut. So sometimes if we're missing, let's just say acromancia, for example, then we won't get enough short chain fatty acid and then the skin knows. And so what happens is the skin becomes dry. It becomes, um, you know, you get little cracks or you have very easily damaged skin because you don't have enough of what are called short chain fatty acids, which are like very small fat protein molecules that are able to heal the skin. And if you think about it, because the skin has a natural oil to it, we don't want to overclean the skin. Um, that's the number one problem I see in babies. Babies should not be showered or bathed every day, not even close. They have a natural oil. We don't want to take it off. Um, but we, sorry, I lost my train of thought. So with, with the short chain fatty acids, we want to make sure that we have enough of those in the gut in order to actually heal the skin. So if you guys have heard of ghee, it's high in butyrate. Ghee is clarified butter. You can eat ghee in your diet temporarily while we increase the good bacteria so that you make enough of butyrate, which is a short chain fatty acid, which heals the, the skin as well. So the nice thing is one benefit or one healing option for the gut is also going to help the skin. Same thing with collagen. You can drink collagen and that helps heal the lining of the gut and it also heals the skin and prevents wrinkles. So it's really nice when we can do things that have multiple benefits. Um, okay, I'm gonna go on to the next one. This is another way of looking at this gut skin connection. We know um, stress negatively impacts the gut. Stress does a bunch of things to the gut, which we've talked about in the previous talk and times when we talked about the adrenals. Number one, stress lowers the amount of saliva you can make. Why? Because the body puts you in fight or flight and now you no longer need to digest your food. The body decides she's running away from the saber tooth tiger. Please preserve all energy and do not allow her to digest food. That's not important right now, right? So stress lowers the amount of saliva you make. It also can either really slow down the transit time of your food or the opposite. It can actually super speed up the transit time. If anybody here has ever had an issue where they went to exercise and work out and then had diarrhea after, you're one of the people where stress has negatively impacted your transit time and your gut is going super fast, trying to like maybe get nutrients or get water from your food because you're dehydrated and you're exercising, or maybe it's because you don't have enough cortisol or you don't have enough progesterone to be exercising. Um, timing is important when you exercise, but remember that exercise is a stress on the, on the system. And if you have questions about you and how you should exercise, talk to Kelly, because she's really good at talking through that. Um, let me just make sure nobody else popped on while we were talking and doesn't need to be let in. Okay, great. Um, awesome. I'll definitely get back to those questions. So the other thing to point out here is if your blood sugar is going up, it actually negatively impacts your skin. Um, if your blood sugar is going up, it increases something called IGF-1, which signals to the gut to absorb less sugar from your food makes sense, right? You actually, if your blood sugar is really high, like you had a hamburger and an ice cream cone, like they're showing here, you want to lower the absorption of glucose from your food. Um, the problem is that also interferes with the way the gut's supposed to work and the natural microbiome. And then you end up also having inflammation in the skin. Okay, so we have direct transit from between the gut and the skin. We also have short chain fatty acids, which are listed over here. And then we also have effect of the system, systemic um, immunity. So I wanna pause for a minute and talk about the lymph system. So there is lymph tissue everywhere. There is lymph tissue called all different things in the brain, in the gut, um, around the liver, on the collarbones, behind the ears, right? And when you have a swollen lymph node, when you're sick, you can feel it. The problem is that unlike the heart, 
which pumps for the blood, the lymph system doesn't have a pump. So the lymph can sit stagnant. If you're not moving, if you're not hydrated, the lymph goes way down. And then we don't want things to be stagnant. Stagnant's the opposite of homeostasis. It's the opposite of what the body wants. So we need to move the lymph enough without stressing the body out by over-exercising in order to have a healthy immune system. It turns out that 75 to 80% of your lymph tissue and lymph nodes actually surround the small and large intestine. So let's just say, for example, you do stool testing and it turns out you have H. pylori in the stomach. You're going to have an inflammation. You're going to have a lot of lymph tissue stuck there. And because it's trying to attack the infection and help with the infection, but it becomes stagnant. And this is okay if it happens for 10 days. It's not okay if you have H. pylori for 10 years. Similarly, in the small intestine, you can have something called SIBO or small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, where you've got some bacteria that have migrated up from the, the colon up to the small intestine that are causing a lot of burping and a lot of belching. And that bacteria triggers the immune system to attack. Again, the immune system is supposed to attack and do its job in short increments. You never want the immune system to attack for longer than, let's just say the flu for you know 10 to 14 days at most, right? You don't want the immune system to chronically be attacking. Um, chronic strep is another good example, which is common in the large intestine. If you have too much streptococcus, you will end up having inflammation of the lymph nodes surrounding the large intestine. It's not as simple as, well, let me just get a lymph massage and just get rid of all that because you haven't addressed the underlying cause, which is there's an imbalance there with too much strep. You need to address that too. So that's where the gut has an effect on the systemic immunity. And then what happens is if all resources are going to addressing an infection in the gut or what the body thinks is an infection in the gut, then the skin no longer has as much lymph, as much drainage that is actively happening. Um, this you can see down here would be where the lymph system is. It's below the skin, but very, very close to the surface. And so the lymph really um, is pulling toxins away. Anything that can get through the skin or that is entered, it's supposed to be filtering. It doesn't do a good job when you also have an infection somewhere else in the body. Does that make sense? So it's like all resources go to the one place where there's the biggest problem and there's a ton of signaling happening. The immune system is super, super smart. It's signaling one organ to the next. Hey, I need this over here. Hey, I need this over here. Think about how your vascular system changes if you start to run and all of the blood flow goes to your legs, right? It's a similar idea. Um, okay, so we also know because of everything we talked about how to heal the gut. We know that our thoughts affect our gut. Um, simple studies have shown us that if you close your eyes for 30 seconds and you picture the lining of the gut healing, picture that like leaky gut looks like shingles on a roof that are all kind of sticking up. If they all begin to lay flat and lay down, then you have a healed gut. If the shingles are overlapping, that's a healed gut. If they're all kind of sticking up um, with leaky spots in between them, that's a leaky gut. So if you close your eyes and you picture, picture your intestine, you can even put your hands on your belly. You can actually imagine what it looks like when the lining of the gut heals. The mucosa lining of the gut should be like a nice, healthy, shiny pink. It should not be red or raw looking, right? So number one is that we can control how quickly our gut heals just by imagining the healing happening. It's that simple. You don't need to buy anything fancy. The other thing is that we used to think the bacteria in the gut and viruses and fungi affect our thoughts. So certain bad bacteria will be more likely to produce negative neurotransmitters or hormones. But we now know it's also the opposite direction. So it goes both directions. When you are faced with adversity and really hard traumas or events in your life, your brain sends signals to the gut that actually destroy some of the good gut bacteria. 
And so it's both directions. So I wanted to point that out because sometimes people hear about this gut brain connection and they don't know what that means. It typically is talking about the intestine being connected to the neurotransmitters or the happy hormones in the brain. And we're going to talk all about that next talk too. The liver must work correctly in order for the gut to work correctly. So I'm going to say that again. The liver must work correctly in order for the gut to be in homeostasis. So the liver essentially detoxifies the blood. It cleans up the blood as the blood comes in to the main vein of the liver. Um, so the most important thing to take away from that is if you can support your liver and take care of your liver, you're also going to give your gut an advantage because now your gut doesn't have to compensate because the gut will compensate for the liver and the liver will compensate for the gut by detoxifying. The gut is also supposed to be taking nutrients out of your food and then keeping the waste products inside the lumen or the tube and then excreting in the feces. So the gut needs to work extra, extra hard if when it receives the blood flow in order to, to digest, the blood is filled with toxins. So this is an example of why sometimes when people drink alcohol, first of all, all alcohol causes leaky gut at least for two hours, sometimes for 12. So all alcohol, all ethanol, the cleanest you can find, the most organic alcohol you can find, it's still just ethanol in and of itself actually causes leaky gut. But now what happens if somebody drinks too much? So they have not just one glass, but they have six. The liver can't keep up. So the liver can't filter the ethanol out of the bloodstream um, and send it to the kidneys to be excreted. And now what happens is the, the alcohol content goes up and now the gut becomes more and more and more inflamed. So the best thing you can do, especially if you accidentally have a little bit too much alcohol, is the next day you can fast. Oh, I also wanted to plug Dr. Salibi just published an article. I will put it in the chat two weeks ago on fasting and how fasting helps with long COVID. A um, really great article that got published. So, um, but Dr. Salibi is my mentor. So I'll post that later. But fasting is one of the best ways you can heal your gut. Tw a 24 hour fast can reset your gut. Um, fasting is not advised if you're underweight, if you're a child, if you're pregnant, if you're breastfeeding. Um, let me know if you're not sure if you're underweight and I can tell you. Hormones also affect the skin. As we already kind of mentioned, DHEA and pro progesterone are the biggest that I see. If your progesterone is too low or your DHEA is too high, you're more likely to have acne. And then blood sugar, we already mentioned that definitely can affect your skin. One of the ways that blood sugar also affects your skin is if your blood sugar stays too high for a prolonged period of time, what happens is the sugar stays in the blood because there's no more room for it to be taken into the cells and the sugar that's in the blood actually poisons the nerves. And so the most common thing we see is ulcers on the bottom of people's feet. And that's because they can't feel when they're walking around, they can't really feel very well because the nerves have been poisoned and then they have um, scrapes and lots of issues that become ulcers on their bottoms of their feet. So we tell people with type two diabetes or type one that's uncontrolled to check the bottoms of their feet in the mirror. Okay. We've kind of covered everything I wanted to say there. Um, we already mentioned DHEA. The other thing about acne is that the short chain fatty acids are really important. So most of the time when people have acne and I do a stool test, they are low on acetate, propionate, or butyrate. Those are the three short chain fatty acids we really need to prevent acne. Um, there are also probiotics being marketed for skin health. I'll show you those at the end and explain the caveat with them. Okay, so a couple more things here and then we'll move on to the mouth. I don't have a ton to say about the mouth, but we know that people with acne are more likely to experience GI symptoms. People that have acne are more likely to have constipation, halitosis, which is bad breath, reflux or abdominal bloating. So what does that mean? Is it correlation or causation? Well, now we think based on research that it is likely causation. So what's happened is the gut has become inflamed. There's either dysbiosis or leaky gut or both. And now the patient develops acne. Does that make sense? So 54% um, of acne sufferers have marked 
alterations in their intestinal microflora, which is the same thing as microbiome, same word, um, same meaning. And then I'm not going to go too much into this just to mention LPS. So LPS is lipopolysaccharides, um, gram negative bacteria that are harmful that, to the gut that are present in dysbiosis produce something called LPS. So the LPS is a byproduct of the bad bacteria that we don't want there. And then what happens is the LPS is travel, travels straight to the brain and straight to the skin. And the LPS actually is what causes disease and immune system breakdown in both the brain and the skin. Patients with Alzheimer's are much, much, much more likely to have high levels of LPS, which means they have bad bacteria in their gut causing their disease. It's really fascinating when you start to learn more about everything the gut does. Um, it's really the basis for all of our health is the gut, right? Um, the only other thing I wanted to talk about here was medications. So some things will lower our saliva or cause dry mouth antihistamines like Zyrtec or Benadryl. We always wanna have you on those temporarily and get to the root cause of what's causing your allergies. And as soon as we've gotten to the root cause and treated it, we wanna take you off those. Because if you have dry mouth, you're missing amylase, which is the number one enzyme you need starts step one of digestion starts in your mouth. So if you have dry mouth, which we're going to, it's going to be a good lead into the health of the mouth. But if you have dry mouth, talk to me and we can figure out how to fix it. Some people also have dry mouth because of an autoimmune illness called Sjogren's. We also know that, um, I already said LPS. Yep. Okay. I'm going to leave the rest of this alone. This is a picture of what the gut looks like when it's under duress, when it's unhealthy over here. Um, and this over here on the left is actually the healthy gut. Okay, so, you know, the way that we achieve healthy skin is to hydrate from within. So plenty of water. I'm going to pause and drink water as I say that. Plenty of vitamin C because when we eat vitamin C in our food, we produce more hyaluronic acid. Have any women on this call heard of hyaluronic acid? Because it is like the top, the buzzword when it comes to wrinkles. It turns out that applying hyaluronic acid topically works like 1% to what happens if you're making your own hyaluronic acid because your body is hydrated and you have enough vitamin C and that's the key to healthy skin is get hydrated, prevent wrinkles by eating enough vitamin C. All of these fancy creams, most of them don't really work that well because it's really the key to healthy skin is really internal, right? I think I've kind of explained that a few different ways. Um, we also want to decrease air pollution exposure. This is really important. There's a lot of mold toxins and heavy metals and microplastics and pesticides in air pollution. Um, there's a lot of things coming out of car exhaust. So again, we talked about this last time, but if you're running or you're exercising on the road where the cars are driving, you're going to take in so many more toxins than if you're able to get to a park or a place where you're exercising away from cars. Um, I'm going to go through probiotics at the end quickly. Um, yeah, no, nothing else here is really that drastically different than what you already know. Um, this is another way of looking at some things that help or hurt the gut. Probiotics also regulate the T cells, just like vitamin D and short chain fatty acids. So we've got vitamin D, short chain fatty acids. Those are good. Short chain fatty acids are good. Vitamin D is good. T cells are good. Um, Probiotics are good, right? The probiotics are the good bacteria that we can take by mouth. The other thing that's really great for regulatory T cells is actually rosemary. So sometimes you can actually apply rosemary oil straight to the skin as a last resort if you have a lot of inflammation on the skin, or you can take rosemary tea internally um, to help with the immune system imbalance. Here's the healthy, here's the unhealthy. I'm not gonna go too much into this. There's also IGF-1 here, which is an inflammatory immune marker. We do not want that. We we want inflammation temporarily, but not long-term. So 10 days of inflammation, but not 10 years. 
Okay, so on the left, this is GI Resolve. GI Resolve contains zinc carnosine, glutamine, glucosamine, MSM, licorice, okra, and aloe. If you are not allergic to any of these, this is my favorite gut healing product. If you have leaky gut or dysbiosis, if you have leaky gut and dysbiosis, this by itself is not enough. We need to figure out what foods you're reacting to. We need to figure out which good bacteria you're missing, okay? So, but it's a good starting place. This and collagen every single day would be a good way to prevent leaky gut in your kids or in people that, you know, are exposed. They're in the real world, right? So we can't avoid exposure to mold completely or plastics or heavy metals completely. We live in the real world. This is a good way to keep your gut healthy. Um, it's also great if you already know you have leaky gut or dysbiosis. The other thing I like, this is interesting. This is called Skinessa. And this is a bacteria, sorry, a probiotic that was made from these bacteria. And it tends to help with rosacea. I don't know that I've seen it help with other things yet, but here's the caveat. You have to have your stool testing done if you're having skin issues, because this is not customized to you. This is like the general studies that they did showed probably if you have rosacea, you probably are low in these bacteria. What I see though is very different. I see stool tests come back with all different things. Everybody's unique. Your stool results are like your fingerprint. They're extremely unique. You can be missing specific bacteria that are not listed here. Also, this is like a drop in the bucket because there's trillions of bacteria in the gut. So no one, back, no one probiotic is just gonna magically fix everything. But it's a great start, right? I already talked a little bit about what the liver does. We will do another workshop where we do um, detox foods and we'll talk more about the liver then. Okay, hey, um, what, was the, what was that last supplement? I'm sorry, what was that last supplement that oh, we couldn't see the name of it? The one on the left? This is GI Resolve on the left. GI Resolve, okay, thank you. Yep, yep. And there's other formulations that are similar. I just tend to like that one the best. I, I promise they're not giving me any money to tell you that. Um, <laughs> Okay, I'm going to I'm going to come back to the liver stuff when we do the healthy eating. This is the last thing we wanted to talk about is just that we know that the mouth is also we also want to treat this like organic gardening. Right? So when if you guys know anything about gardening, I know Amy's an expert, when we give the soil lots of nutrients to grow, the soil becomes really really rich and then you get much better vegetables in your garden right? So it's the same idea. We want to feed all of the microbiome that's in the mouth, the flora that's in the mouth, and we don't want to kill the good stuff in the mouth. And this is where we make the biggest mistake with children all the way to adults. People are doing so many things to kill the good bacteria or, or viruses or yeast in the mouth. Number one is smoking cigarettes that kills all the good bacteria in your mouth. Number two is probably mouthwashes. Number three is probably um, fluoride in the water, chlorine. All of our water that, it, you know, if you have tap water has chlorine in it. So figure out a way to filter your water so you're not killing all the good stuff in your mouth. And then the last thing is conventional toothpaste. Kill all the good gut, all the good, not gut, but oral microbiome. So look for something like biocidin has a toothpaste, biocidin also, the tincture itself is a mixture of 12 herbs that actually heal the oral microbiome. Um, try some oil pulling, which is just taking coconut oil and gently swishing it around for as long as you can stand it, up to 20 minutes, and then spitting it out because that's how you've cleaned without killing all of the good stuff. Um, do everything you can you know, to read the products you're using um, during COVID, I have people use that you can use like a conventional mouthwash, but otherwise no, because the mouthwash contains specific antibiotics that are killing the good stuff in the gut. Um, the last thing to mention with the mouth is candida. So candida is a yeast that should be present, but not in large amounts, just like staph should be there, but not in such large amounts that it takes over. So with candida, um, we also want to address, sometimes your tongue will actually have a white coating or a slightly white coating on it. 
And you could look in the mirror every morning and look at your tongue and see how am I doing? If I have candida, how's it going? Um, I also have quite a few patients with Crohn's that when they have a Crohn's flare, they also get really bad thrush, which is candida on their tongue. They can see it. It gets really thick and fuzzy. And some patients will also tell me when they're, when their mouth is not in homeostasis, they'll tell me that they feel like a furriness when they wake up in the morning. So you can actually do a spit test where you have a glass of water and you spit into it and you see if you can look for the legs of the candida to actually pop up. So I can send that to you guys later. Um, just a reminder that poor oral health or an imbalance of the bacteria in the mouth is the number one cause of heart disease. So I don't think people realize that. Um, if you have gum disease, you're twice as likely to die from a heart attack and three times as likely to die from stroke. Um, again, natural toothpaste using baking soda instead. But if you pick up a typical crest is so abrasive and contains antibiotics, you're, you're not, you're going to end up killing a lot of the good stuff. Um, we know that the oral microbiome is important for every other part of the body to be healthy. This is what candida looks like when it gets really bad. I promise I'm on the last slide. And then what is biological dentistry? Okay, I actually don't really love the name biological dentistry. I just think it's very confusing. It's like the word organic. It, it doesn't tell you what it is. It's not specific. Um, biological dentistry is basically the same thing as integrative dentistry, holistic dentistry. And what you want is you want a dentist who understands your entire body. You don't want a dentist who just looks at your teeth and doesn't look at your skin, ask you about brain fog, talk to you about if you've had mold exposure or Lyme. You want someone who understands that they're all connected. My first experience with this was my thyroid disorder. I had a dentist tell me that the tooth she was putting a crown on was linked. It was one of my upper teeth that was specifically linked to thyroid disease because there are meridians from a Chinese medicine standpoint that run right through fascinating, right? Because that was also when my thyroid stopped working, when I had a cavity in that tooth. That's all I have. So let me go through the chat. Um, it's 1245. I'm going to pause the recording just so you guys feel comfortable saying anything. Um, let me do this. Thank you.